Hello everybody, welcome to the world famous Florence Institute, more affectionately known of course as The Flood. My name is Tommy Calderbank, Maggie's eldest, and it's my pleasure and privilege to be your guide for this virtual tour of the Floddy Archive. Today, The Floddy is a charity uh, which exists in the heart of Liverpool 8, and our stunning Grade 2 listed building is a vital and viable community hub meeting much of the social and educational needs of the people of the area. But what about the early history of the Flory? Until recently our past was obscured even to us, until the chance discovery of a treasure trove of archive documents led us to set up the Flory Archive. So please sit back, relax and join us as we explore the fascinating history of the Flory. So the Florence Institute was built in 1889 um, with a very, very specific purpose in mind. An acceptable place of recreation and instruction for the poor and working boys of this district of the city. And for almost a century it provided uh, instruction and entertainment uh, and edification for the poor and working boys of this district. Bernard built the building in honour of his daughter Florence. Florence herself had died at the tender age of 22 on the Grand Tour of Europe and is in fact commemorated here in an exquisite marble relief bust at the top of the first flight of stairs, almost like a guardian angel looking out for the building for over 130 years. Bernard Hall commissioned noted local architect Cornelius Sherlock to design his institute at a cost of just £15,000. Sherlock's previous commissions included the Walker Art Gallery, and the Picton reading rooms in the William Brown Library, so his work was absolutely top class. In the case of the Florence, he designed an absolute palace for the people. In an Italianate design, the curved stonework, the beautiful balustrades, the pinnacles on the roof and the central tower are all indicative of Victorian opulence. Um, and this is really exemplified in our case with the magnificence of the Grand Hall, the reading rooms and the gym. Of course, a building as magnificent as the Florey would always be very expensive to maintain. And indeed, the first problems appeared as early as 1897. Uh, the costs of running such a magnificent building were very high and donations were required from local wealthy folks who shared Bernard Hall's vision. In 1912, the first major renovations occurred when electric lighting was installed at some considerable cost throughout the building, as reported in the 1912 annual report. In 1934, the Duke of Gloucester complimented the Flory thus. On having a finer building than any other boys club which he had visited. Despite its grandeur, by the 1950s, the community were deeply concerned about the safety and appeal of the Florence and they noted, the club premises are an ever-present cause of anxiety, and after 67 years of hard work, the continual maintenance costs are a very heavy drain on our resources. Your committee are doing their utmost to brighten them up and make them more attractive. By the 1960s, an extensive modernisation project was unveiled to great fanfare. Some parts of the building were indeed unrecognisable. A gathering of more than 500 were greatly impressed with the changes, renovations and general brightening up, designed to break completely with the tradition of brown paint and grey stone usually found in boys clubs. This break has indeed been achieved, and I admired the new streamlined entrance with its glass swing doors, the canteen cum coffee bar with its contemporary layout, and the excellent and imaginative murals on the walls of the games room. By 1961, the Florey had cemented its place as one of the finest boys clubs in England. However, beyond the architectural merit, it was the activities of the club that really made its name. There's no doubt that, as one of the first boys clubs in the country, the Florey was a trailblazer. And indeed, its first few years of programming was very, very experimental. However, the committee quickly realised that they ought to move away from formal work training and focus more on character development, in their belief that working class boys, if left unattended, uh, could be led uh, astray. And so 
they started to move away from formal way of training and more towards in recreation, uh, entertainment and hobbies, such as in the 1912-13 annual report, the detailing of activities as diverse as budgie and fish breeding, woodwork and rifle shooting. However, it's in the realm of sport that the flurry really starts to make its mark. It's here that a generation of boys' hearts were captured by a whole range of sports and how excellence was developed both individually and on a team level, uh, both nationally and internationally. In the early years, the main sporting attractions were swimming, which took place at the Stebble Street Baths around the corner, and gymnastics. And huge crowds were reported to these events uh, to cheer on the competitors and to be thrilled by the sport achievements. The boys were sternly reminded by the committee that it wasn't the winning, but the taking part that counts. Perhaps best exemplified by the Flores motto, No pains, no gains. As is expected in a city like Liverpool, it was football that really took centre stage, and the Flory had multiple teams. The best of these was Florence Albion FC, who won pretty much everything they entered. They travelled internationally, uh, they played at Anfield, and they became a byword for success on the pitch. And in 1971, Brian Robinson became the first Flory old boy to represent his country for England boys clubs. Of course, boxing is a major part of Liverpool's sport and culture, and it's in the ring that some of the Flory boys made their biggest marks. The punch ball appears to be the favourite. At the same time, be they old or young, there does not appear to be any objection among our members to the hard knocks with gloves. Champions like Alan Rudkin, uh, Tommy Bish, Larry Paul, Dick Tiger, and of course, the late lament of Billy Williams, uh, a, a, a huge friend of the Flory, were all champions in their day and trained up generations of lads. One of the innovative techniques that Billy used was uh, to take advantage of the fact that they were in a very small space and they only had one punch bag. They would have four lads training on the one bag and they would tie their shoelaces together yeah, so they were unable to back away and that I feel gave fly boxers that uh, edge to stand their ground, not to back down and to fight. Many of the sports were enjoyed over the years in the fly, including baseball, basketball, cricket, chess, even weightlifting is mentioned in the archive. However, there's another strand of activity that became a hallmark of club life and that was the summer camps. Joseph Cunningham was the first superintendent in the Flory in 1889. Uh, he previously worked at the Borden Institute in Kirkdale. Joseph was passionate about outdoor activities away from the city air, and so in 1892 he arranged for the first 200 Flory boys to go to Laxey on the Isle of Man for a camp, and this established a real tradition in the club. When he left the Florence, he set up Cunningham's camps which arguably invented the Great British Holiday Camp. He's fittingly commemorated in the Isle of Man with a stamp. Thanks to the generosity of supporters, generations of boys were able to access different camps, from as close as Heswell in Whittle, all the way across into intercontinental Europe. In 1962, Flory boys covered over a thousand miles on a camp to Belgium. Indeed, Many old boys have been in touch with us since to credit the Flory with opening up the world to them. The traditional camps were complemented by the Adventure Club, which was a hiking club targeting mostly Scotland and Wales. The Flory boys were always commended for their ingenuity and for their indefatigability. Indeed, one comment that a camp ought to be abandoned in the face of terrible weather was met with very derisive remarks of a kind not unknown in the dingle. Indeed, great indignation at the thought of Flory lads jacking it in. Flory boys clearly knew how to have a good laugh. A 1964 report uh, mentioned the Scottish expedition kits, which were arranged by the boys, bowler hats and walking sticks, which were donned throughout the expedition. 
Once the staff had recovered from the shock, or indeed during the first 24 hours, when we stopped en route pretending that we weren't with them, one got used to the incredulous glances and sometimes remarks from onlookers. One of the party possessed the ultimate in headgear, a top hat. How does one describe the scene when they boarded the inter-island ferry at Ardrossan as the lads, led by the top hatted one, climbed the gangplank and each in turn gravely doffed their bowlers to the thunderstruck officer at the head of the rail? Accounts of the camp show that the funny boys clearly had a sense of fun. However, in a city like Liverpool, just to be famed for its music, entertainment would always be an important part of fly life. Victorian ideas of entertainment were very wholesome indeed. It was all about raising the standards and cultural tastes of the individual, their family and the whole area. Entertainment couldn't just be itself, it had to be character building as well. So to this end, musical and dramatic performances uh, were given by eager volunteers here on a Saturday evening. Star turns included the thespian nomads, the crew of the HMS Indefatigable and a ladies mandolin band, all for a penny. Audiences were initially unimpressed, but they soon warmed to the cultural offer. At the beginning of the season, good music obtained only an indifferent hearing but a taste for it seemed to be developed, and the last miscellaneous concert met with more genuine appreciation than any that had gone before. Whatever the reason, audiences grew from 200 to over 1,000, filling the Grand Hall to capacity. The Flory's most popular act was of course the Flory Minstrels, whose raucous performances of music and dance gave the committee some concern, as it was felt that they were straying far from the Institute's moral ethos. The committee's and instructor's chief difficulty is to keep these entertainments thoroughly refined and free from vulgarity. And should they not always have succeeded in this in the past, they hope to be more successful in the future. The golden age of entertainment lasted for over 20 years at the Flory. But by 1910, a host of competitors had sprung up in the area. Other clubs, pubs and the mighty picture drone all conspired to take audiences away from the Flory and as a consequence, in 1912, the Saturday evening entertainment in the Florham cancelled. During the interwar years, it was the Florey Old Boys who organised the most popular events here in the form of dancers. This was one of the few opportunities you had to meet members of the opposite sex. And indeed, my nan met my granddad here at a penny dance, so you can blame the Florey. A 1937 edition of the Florentian newsletter gave inexperienced dancers the following dubious advice on how to dance. Walk straight to her and say, what about this dance, babe? Or, let's grease the floor, sweetheart. Sometimes the more experienced dancers would just give a nod or lift a finger and beckon, but it's best not to do it this way on account of the delicacy and finesse required, which takes years of practice to obtain. The next thing to do is to hold the partner in the correct manner. Put your right arm around the waist and take hold of her right arm with your left. It's best not to hold her too tight because of the undignified appearance, and perhaps the girl might not like it. Although, no notice should be taken of what the partner thinks or says. By the 1950s, the Florey was modernising. A new US import had come over, the teenager, along with Skiffle. The Skiffle boom of the 1950s was massive and overtook the whole of the UK. Um, Skiffle was a mixture of folk, blues and jazz, largely improvised on homemade instruments. It was music for the people, by the people, really DIY. By 1957, the Florey had its own Skiffle group, who performed here, there and everywhere. A young Jerry Marsden, later of Jerry and the Pacemakers of course, played a special gig here in 1957 with his band, the Red Mountain Skiffle Group, at a special concert attended by the Lord Mayor Dixie Dean, amongst others, and the rest, of course, is history. Skiffle groups were always on the, on the bill at a very special uh, place called the Fiesta Club, which was right here in the Flurry. Senior members approached the warden and asked if they could redecorate, and they converted these rooms all along here into effectively a Spanish courtyard. They put on nights for members and their girlfriends, which involved uh, music and, of course, lots and lots of dancing. Though successful, the committee remained deeply anxious 
at the mixing of boys and girls in such a heavy atmosphere. The age of rock and roll seems to have dispelled the old courtesies one associated with mixed activities. But nevertheless, both boys and girls were obviously enjoying themselves. The Fiesta Club had over 200 members, with demand often outstripping capacity. The committee were deeply impressed by the very high standards of dress and behaviour of its members. Young people, given modern facilities and a proper opportunity, are perfectly capable of running their own affairs successfully. And this, in itself, is one of the ideals towards which the youth service should strive. The success of the Fiesta Club attracted lots of competitors and by 1964, the club sadly closed. In the 130 years since she first opened the doors, the Florida has been no stranger to adversity. From outbreaks of smallpox to the devastations of both world wars and the economic devastation of the 1980s, the archive throws some light over these very painful periods in our history. So let's explore some of those painful periods in a little more detail. 1894 saw the smallpox outbreak, uh, which caused the closure of the Florida for two months while it was thoroughly cleaned and disinfected and repainted at a cost of 80 pounds, which is six and a half thousand in today's money. Smallpox is a highly infectious disease uh, which spreads rapidly in densely populated areas, such as the Dingle. Even Mr Cunningham, the superintendent, fell prey to it and the Floddy's programme had a knock-on effect with the cancellation of the Saturday night entertainments, the summer camps and the educational programme. With regard to the work carried out on the Institute during the past year, the committee has, unfortunately, little to report on, as owing to the outbreak of infectious disease within the building. In spite of the careful precautions taken by the committee, the Institute had to be closed for two months and before reopening to be thoroughly disinfected, cleaned and painted. In 1914, following the outbreak of World War I, the Floddy Committee reflected, In one way we have been hard hit, and that is in the loss, for a time at any rate, of a very large number of those who have grown up as members of the Institute. We miss their familiar faces and can only hope they may be restored to us in all the vigour of their youth and strength. They deserve well of their country and of their native city. By 1915, the shadow of war loomed large over the building. A significant number of the cadet battalion had joined the senior forces. Throughout the war, the superintendent kept in touch with all the recent Florida members on active service. At Christmas, they sent cards to the wall. That this was appreciated, there can be no doubt, judging by the many letters received from the boys themselves. The warm affection of members towards the Institute has been shown again and again. The expression, the good old Flory, is perhaps the most common in all their letters, and conveys the strong feeling they have towards the Institute. As the war continued, the increasing length of the Institute's casualty list caused grave concern, and reports included lists of servicemen who gave their lives. We feel the loss of these promising youths very keenly. The majority of them were regular in their attendance at the Institute, and keen on attaching themselves to one or more of the club activities. Our sympathies go out to the parents of these brave boys, who in the face of the gravest danger never hesitated about doing their duty, and we feel sure this knowledge will be a consolation in their deep distress. The Flory War Memorial plaque, which still adorns the main staircase in the building, commemorates the members who fell. In the immediate aftermath of World War I, a lack of voluntary workers caused much distress and a huge question mark hung over the future of the Institute. Indeed. Unless more help is forthcoming, it is hard to see how the work of the Institute can be adequately performed. There are no annual reports in the war years between 1939 and 1945, but in a copy of the Florence Institute News from 1945, it gave special mention to returning old boys coming home to the Institute and featured letters from men on active service. I would give anything to be back there doing the things we used to do. Gym, billiards, table tennis, basketball, Lots of luck to the Flory lads. In a post-war message, the honorary treasurer remarks of the importance of the building surviving the Blitz. First things first, and one is that we should be very thankful that our building came to no serious harm during the Blitzes on our city. Our tower had to be removed as being dangerous, no doubt the result of enemy action. Had the Flory became a casualty, I feel sure the boys of the neighbourhood would have realised what the club meant to them. 
and its loss would have made a gap in their lives at a very important age. The Flory was always a barometer at the times. The economic and physical desolation that hit the UK during the 1980s and hit Liverpool particularly hard took its toll here too. The decade started badly. Following the Toxteth riots or uprisings of 1981, the chair of the committee wrote these heartbreaking words. What a year it has been. We have plumbed the depths, notably in early July when all we stood for appeared to have added up to nothing in terms of the achievement of nearly a hundred years service to Toxteth. Even the word Toxteth was removed from its geographical meaning to become synonymous with Brixton or Detroit or other worldwide areas of civil unrest, a condition rather than a place. The rest of the decade was increasingly bleak. The building had become a large let, mostly to manpower services, and when they pulled the plug and left, the future seemed Impossible. The Flory closed the doors in 1988, seemingly for the final time, just one year shy of her centenary. The stories and history shown in this short film represents only a tiny fragment of the massive archive the Flory have uncovered. If you'd like to see it for yourself first hand, why don't you book an appointment with us to come and see us in our Heritage Resource Centre where you can view the documents first hand for yourself. You can also pay us a visit online at thefloryarchive.org where you can see every annual report since 1890 as well as a, a plethora of photographs, uh, videos and other content. You can use the site to sign the Flory Visitors Book and share your memories of the Flory or you can nominate an old boy to our Hall of Fame where we celebrate the achievements of our past members. This project to safeguard and digitise the Flory Archive would not have been possible without the kind support of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Mm -hmm.